So over the weekend, uh, I was on Reliable Sources on CNN with Brian Stelter. Uh, he's the host of that program. Uh, they were kind enough to have me on, and that's partly because of you guys. You know, they, last weekend uh, they had three establishment uh, members of the press who all agreed that the media was wonderful to Bernie Sanders and not at all biased, uh, and that uh, it, that all the Sanders people had math problems. Uh, a lot of you guys complained about that, justfully so, saying, "Hey, wait, where's the Sanders supporter?" Uh, and then, to their credit, reliable sources had me on uh, to have this discussion. Now, uh, some of you thought that the segment was short, but that's all TV segments. It wasn't cut short, it was nothing of that sort whatsoever. That's just how long they had slotted for that segment. I've hosted uh, TV shows. I know that they are uh, quick and, and, you, and you do have to move on when you get to a commercial break. So I just want to give you guys more context because uh, um, there's so much more to that story about the discussion we were having about superdelegates versus pledge delegates. So luckily I have my own show and so I'll do that here. <laughs> okay. So for those of you who missed the appearance, uh, I was explaining that uh, superdelegates vote at the convention and in fact if they're not at the convention, they can't vote. So a lot of the people who say, yeah, I'll support Hillary Clinton, if they don't go to the convention, uh, won't be able to vote at all. So counting them is wrong. And in fact, they often switch votes. Uh, Hillary Clinton had a hundred superdelegate lead against Barack Obama in the beginning of the 2008 run, and by the beginning of May, that lead had completely evaporated, and that was in the middle of a contested run. So it wasn't after she had lost. It was during the run that the superdelegates switched. So they do switch all the time. So counting them as if they have voted is wrong. Now I got to say that on air on TV, um, but. Um, and in this case, there's also a good reason why they might switch their votes, uh, because there's a possible indictment looming out there. There's a dozen FBI agents investigating Hillary Clinton right now. In 2008, there was no similar situation. There was not a looming indictment of Barack Obama, no investigations or agents looking into him. Um, so obviously, we have a slightly different situation here. In fact, I actually want to skip ahead right now to uh, Louis Miranda, and that's uh, video one, guys. Uh, so he is the communications director for the DNC. So it's not just me saying this. Uh, even the DNC went on, of all places, CNN, talked to Jake Tapper and told him, hey, it's not accurate to count the superdelegates until they vote. Watch. The reality is, is that 85% of the delegates at the convention are selected by the results of primaries and caucuses, so the voters themselves are the single biggest factor in who becomes the nominee. Uh, superdelegates, I think one of the problems is the way the media reports it. Any night that you have a primary or caucus, the media lumps in superdelegates that they've basically polled because they just call them up and say, who are you supporting? They don't actually vote until the convention, and so they shouldn't be included in any count on primary or caucus night because the only thing you're picking on primary and caucus nights are the pledged delegates based on the vote. But what about when we do, so our, to when we do our totals, you think it's okay to include? Not yet, because they're not actually voting, and they're likely to change their minds. Very interesting. The DNC itself saying don't include superdelegates in the totals to cable networks like our own. Now, that was over a month ago. They didn't listen to Miranda. They didn't listen to the DNC. And it wasn't like, hey, the DNC is telling you to do something political. They were telling you about their rules. This is our rules. They they don't vote till the convention, so it doesn't make sense. It's counterfactual to count them until they have voted. Don't include them in the overall delegate count. They go, oh, those are your rules. I don't care. I'm going to include them anyway. You said it on our air. I don't care. I'm going to include them anyway. Now, Stelter afterwards wrote a piece explaining why. He says, look, it's more information. It's not. Why shouldn't I give my uh, viewers more information? As I explained when I was on air there, look, it's one thing to say, hey. Here's a superdelegate count to the side, and if they vote this way, well then Hillary Clinton will have a huge advantage. That's totally fair. But if you include them in the overall delegate count, that makes it appear that she has a gigantic lead. And yes, it is a factor in the races. Unfortunately, a certain percentage of voters vote based on who they think is winning. Now that seems crazy to me. I, I would vote based on policy, who I favored more, but some people go in there and go, well, she or he is winning. In fact, this helped Donald Trump in the Republican race a lot. He's a winner. And look, he's winning. I'm going to vote for him. The second part of that is even larger. People who think, well, there's no point in voting. The race is over. I had an Uber driver several months ago in the heat of the campaign when it was neck and neck say to me, oh, I'm a huge Sanders supporter, but the race is already over. She lives in California. 
I said, the race is nowhere near over. Where did you get that idea? She said, I don't know, I watch TV. So does that depress the vote? Of course it depresses the vote for some percentage of voters. And by the way, this race is incredibly close. Could that percentage have made a difference? Of course it could have. So let me show you the numbers so you have the perfect context. So here's the number of de Democratic uh, delegates uh, involved. This is from Bloomberg. You need uh, 2,383 to win the nomination. Now, if you include superdelegates, uh, Hillary Clinton has 2,316 and Bernie Sanders has 1,547. But as you can tell there, she has 547 superdelegates. Bernie Sanders only has 46. And so far, 902 have not been allocated yet. That was before this weekend's elections. Okay? So now, who are the superdelegates? They're not people based on, picked based on the voting. They are current and former Democratic Party officials, largely. So they are literally the establishment of the Democratic Party. Now, if you look at the percentages, Hillary Clinton has 92% of the establishment backing her. And Bernie Sanders has only eight. Now, those percentages were fairly similar when this race began. So when you start uh, an election and you say, okay, 90% of the uh, vote is going to Hillary Clinton so far and only 10% to Bernie Sanders, people get a sense, oh, man, she's got a huge lead. She's winning. But nobody's even voted yet. And throughout, they included it and they included it, they included it from day one. Including it now is far less problematic than including it back then and throughout the entire process. I mean, did you not know that they vote till later? Did you not know that if you include them in the overall count, that that might sway people's votes? If you don't know that and you cover politics, boy, that's deeply problematic. You, you got to really think about what career you've chosen if you don't understand that elementary basics of politics. So let me give you more context. Right now, pledge delegates are 1,779 to Hillary Clinton and 1,501 to Bernie Sanders. Wait a minute, that looks like a much closer race, doesn't it? In fact, that's 54.2% to 45.8%. So we're looking at 54.46 there, right? That's a very close race. Now, when you add in the superdelegates, even at this late date, so it's not 90 to 10 anymore, but now when you add the superdelegates in the establishment, all of a sudden it's 60 to 40. Well, that's a blowout. And that is what leads a lot of the mainstream press to not just now, but for the last, not just several weeks, but several months to say to Bernie Sanders, why don't you drop out already? You, she's got this huge lead on you, 60 to 40, you're not going to make a... 20 point difference there? That's crazy. Well, that's because you already put the superdelegates in. Where is that 5446? And certainly earlier in the race, when it was just as close and there was a lot more runway to pick up more delegates, well, then Bernie Sanders had every ability to switch those superdelegates in exactly the same way that Barack Obama did by winning more pledged delegates. But you never gave him that chance. Instead, you tilted the playing field. Hillary Clinton, overwhelming favorite, overwhelming favorite. That's what you said from day one. That's the bias. If you can't see that bias, it's because you don't want to see that bias. I don't know how much clearer I can make it. And I think that they, you even acknowledge it. Now, okay, th that is one example, but I can give you a thousand examples of how they were uh, biased against Bernie Sanders. Let me just note a, a thematic one here. So. Throughout the process, we were told, oh, these radical positions, and, 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 and this guy, he's a socialist, and, and they asked him about it in every debate, oftentimes two, three times a debate, and not pragmatic. Is it really realistic to be able to do these things? First, I'm going to give you a quote from Martin Luther King to give you a sense of how real change happens. It's back from 1963. He said, we have also come to this hell spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now, throughout the process, they could have framed it as, wait, why is Hillary Clinton offering the tranquilizing drug of gradualism? How about the fierce urgency of now? How about all these voters who are saying, and, and, and the tremendous crowds of Bernie Sanders and the excitement, the energy, and the voters, 
Millions of voters coming out and saying, we want the fierce urgency of now. Well, Hillary Clinton, why won't you say that you'll act now? Why do you hide behind so-called pragmatism? I'm not saying they should have framed it that way, but they could have, but they didn't. They chose to frame it in exactly the opposite way. Oh, Bernie Sanders, unrealistic. Talking about how he's going to make all these changes. Universal health care, unrealistic. But wait a minute, it's in every other developed country. Why is that unrealistic? Free college education. And it's in the framing of the questions. They ask in every debate, Bernie Sanders, isn't that unrealistic? Now, let me show you how realistic it is. You know that Bernie Sanders' program for free college is $75 billion a year. Now, that might sound like a lot of money. Wow, $75 billion a year. Do you know how much the Iraq war cost? $1.7 trillion dollars, trillion dollars. We could have had free college education for our kids for as far as the eye can see. But Hillary Clinton was pragmatic in voting for the Iraq war that wasted 1.7 trillion dollars, let alone all the lives lost. But Bernie Sanders is not pragmatic for wanting your kids to get a real education and real opportunity at only 75 billion dollars a year within this context. It's all in the framing. They framed it completely against Bernie Sanders from day one. They did it with the math, they did it with the numbers, they did it on the policies. Now they turn around and go, oh, why can't you guys do math? That is hilarious. And by the way, one last thing. If you're interested in math, then why didn't you emphasize every single poll that said that Bernie Sanders was more electable than Hillary Clinton? For the last six months, every poll said that he does better than her against every Republican opponent. What, you can't do math? 